Welcome. I'm Dr. Liana Leonoff, and welcome to this RCSI University of Medicine and Health Sciences series. It's a lifestyle medicine positive health podcast series, and today's topic is social connection. And I'm delighted to have with us Dr. Meg. Jordan. She's a clinical medical anthropologist. She's the professor and department chair of integrative health studies at the California Institute of Integral Studies in San Francisco. Welcome, Meg. Thank you. That is a mouthful. You got to, I, appreciate, <laughs> yes. I appreciate spending time with you on this subject. Oh, wonderful to have you. And I, I love this topic. This topic, of course, I'm in the area of positive health and positive psychology, and the root of that is relationships and social connections. So this is my one of my very favorite topics. What first grabbed your attention to this topic? Well, I think my entire working career has really been dedicated to looking at um, why don't people do what they know is good for them? Because for over 50 years, we've known mm, you need good whole foods and solid nutrition. You need daily physical activity. You need to stop smoking. You need to do this and that, sleep well. And yet it's not often enough to push people right into actually doing the behavior. So I've done big surveys of 1,500, 2,000 people that have been published, done recent research as well. And what keeps coming up for me is that one out of four will always say, well, the data was enough to convince me. Therefore, I followed through with all those health behaviors. But three out of four were saying something like, no, oh, my family doesn't do it. I was never did it. I, I don't have a group to do it. I'm intimidated at fitness clubs. I, I don't feel like I feel safe with all that material. They needed some element of social cohesion. And this completely clicked for me as a medical anthropologist because we know from studying Homo erectus to Homo sapien, that niches of humans did not survive unless they were in groups of eight to 15. There wasn't enough of somebody to keep the fire burning and somebody to wipe the baby's butt and somebody to ward off the tiger. So our entire neurophysiology, our hormonal tree network, our prefrontal cortex, everything evolved in a social group, a social setting. Very fascinating, not just for humans, but for all the higher mammals, this has been found. And then it was, hmm, if I can introduce this kind of element of, do you feel safe? Do you feel acknowledged? Do you feel valued? Do you have a sense of belonging? As those factors rose, so did people's health outcomes. So we're getting more and more research saying the power of social connection is undeniable as it relates to healthier lives. It's pretty fun. Yes, and there's more and more coming out about this, about the the health effects, uh, the positive effects of connection, and then also the negative consequences of loneliness. So tell us a little more about, in, in the modern times, what yeah. that means uh, for our health and well-being when we're lonely. Oh, boy. I, I have to credit the UK for a lot of this. <clears throat> you know, they established the first real office of loneliness. It was pretty amazing. And they did it even before COVID. And what they looked at that is um, some of the factors they looked at that there's as social isolation increases and loneliness increases, um, so does kind of access to healthier options. So does your health behavior. Um, you, you start to even have more depression, anxiety that also decreases any chance you have of adopting healthy habits. Sometimes um, you get too isolated, income goes down, expenses go up. I mean, there was multiple factors in every single dimension of well-being that was studied with this. And I kind of saw it firsthand too. I, I, I was, I'm I also an RN and was a cardiac care unit nurse and then a cardiac rehab supervisor. And we saw this in some of our, our cardiac patients that were just struggling with a divorce and new loneliness and being isolated and ostracized from family members. And they would have a massive heart attack when their cholesterol was okay, their blood pressure was okay. We, we just couldn't piece together enough of the biophysical data 
to understand what this heart attack was all about. Well, the Japanese came up with a good word for it too in their linguistic understanding of the crush of the broken heart, the crush of the lonely heart. Again, something about that whole neurophysiology of the heart and its message is just squeezing shut with a cardiac event uh, that was disabling. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I, I think the research, like you just said, is going to keep pouring in. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And one question that often comes up, uh, it'd be great to clarify, is we've been talking about loneliness. Uh, what is the difference between isolation and loneliness? Right. Some people say, I'm not lonely. I like my solitude. And they are. And introverts, you can't push an introvert to suddenly adopting and being happy at a big noisy party. They do need their solitude time and everything else. Social isolation is different than just, it's, it's an extreme measure probably of loneliness, but there's a continuum there. Mm -hmm. A little bit of loneliness, I think, drops into everybody's life at times, right? Mm -hmm. And it is our resilience, our ability to break through it, to make that phone call. Social isolation says, I have cut off my networks. I have clipped each of those bridges and I don't have that resilient way to overcome the discomfort anymore. Yeah, and it's much more severe. Absolutely. Uh, well, um, and l let's dive into the positive side, which is what I'm excited about is, okay, social connection and how, how that, that can help us. Can you share a little bit about the what science is showing between social connection and positive emotions, engagement in life, life purpose and meaning, how all that kind of comes together? <laughs> it all comes together. That's the best thing to say right there. <laughs> It's so fun to see how science has tracked this over the years, you know, and, and Europeans will, will really understand this and, and people throughout the UK. And I think that there was a guy named Harry Harlow. Do you remember your early psych studies? And Harry Harlow was a psychologist who was studying baby rhesus monkeys. And this was way back in the 60s, 80 years ago, right? So he was looking at how you could take a baby rhesus monkey and absolutely put him in a little cage with nothing but a bottle or give him a chance to be in a cage with a warm, fuzzy monkey, mother-like monkey to hold, but she didn't have a bottle. These monkeys would prefer the warm, fuzzy mother versus the one with the bottle. They would starve themselves. It was would never be allowed today. It was be animal cruelty. They would starve themselves in order to not deny themselves of the comfort of a caretaker. So from there, we advanced to even looking at the first studies after World War II um, of mass amount of children that were dislodged from homes and sent up all over the place and what was happening with their own survival and, and ensuing high rates of chronic disorders and, and ailments. And that led to Bowlby's and Ainsworth's work on attachment theory and eventually a major huge studies in the U.S. by Kaiser and um, CDC, Kaiser Permanente, that looked at adverse childhood events. So all these instances of a lack of attachment, a lack of good nurturing caretaking during formative years of childhood leads to pretty lousy statistics later in life. The more of these adverse events you have, the greater risk of even incarceration, suicide. It was just an extraordinary study and thousands more have been done just confirming these results. The good news is that we have learned how to take even those adverse events, even the lack of supportive attachment in the early years, and through certain self-soothing practices and working with a caring coach or a caring therapist or a caring best friend, how to actually feel safe in relationship again, how to how to feel valued and seen and a sense of belonging and how that affects blood pressure, heart rate, lung volume, capacities, functional ability, affects the ability to ward off cognitive decline. I mean, there's there's not a biophysical marker that is not affected by the fact that when we learn to extend social attachment and to heal it, heal earlier trauma, whether it was developmental 
intergenerational or a one-time event, lots of different kinds of trauma in people's lives. But we know now in working with somatic psychotherapy and relational neuroscience, we can start to heal some of this neural circuitry in the brain and actually find ways to enjoy time, to enjoy how to reach out with people, to have more clarity about who we are and as our, our ability to overcome the kind of imposed social isolation I was talking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you you make some wonderful points in bringing all this together in construct of how we can use connection, positive connection for our well-being. But a more practical question is, how do we know? How do we assess our social networks and our social connections that, that we're getting the adequate amount for our health and well-being? I like that. I, I like to work with my own patients and my graduate students in teaching those two sets of questions. There's questions that you ask yourself, and there's questions that those questions kind of appraise your own ability to develop and maintain relationships. So one of those would be, how satisfied are you with your ability to communicate your feelings? How satisfied are you with the time and energy you devote to community or to friendships for fun and play? How satisfied with you are you, are you with your ability to receive support from others? Rate yourself, even on a one to five level. Five, yeah, I, I can reach out. I can express my feelings, right? But then practice some self-soothing behaviors, whether it's meditation or time in nature or, or, or walks with a, with a close friend, somebody you truly trust. Start to expand the ratio of time you spend with people you feel safe and calm and centered with. And as you expand that ratio of time to, compared to time you don't spend with folks like that, you will start to understand how, wow, I, I wasn't communicating my feelings as much as I thought I was. I wasn't receiving support or asking for help as much as I thought I was. There's a difference now. You can also start to assess your relationships. That's the other set of questions. How safe do you feel in somebody's presence? How safe do you feel when disagreeing with them? When you acknowledge that there's differences um, and when there's differences, do you feel, still feel a sense of safety and calm? Um, that speaks to the degree of what we call good vagal tone. Mm. That's a, a term used by therapists. And, and it means that we have engaged our social nervous system it's not a different set of wires in the body. It's how we coordinate our autonomic responses with having a better idea from the prefrontal cortex, the higher functioning brain center, to actually using that better idea, taking a breath, taking a pause, mm -hmm. telling yourself you're going to be okay. You're not alone. You can call a good friend. You can call somebody. You can reach out. Mm -hmm. That is all part of cultivating what we call a social nervous system Parkinson's is brilliant research mm -hmm. and um, it works. It works. I'm working with incarcerated folks right now. And I'll tell you, they are some of the most um, sad and tragic stories of upbringing that you've ever heard. Right. And for them to learn self-soothing behaviors, to extend their social networks for better health outcomes, it's bringing down blood pressure. It's correcting some hyperlipidemia issues. It's allowing them to have more self-regulation regarding their emotional um, reactivity, actually having responses that take a pause and are more calming. They don't feel like they're in an emergency all the time, you know? So if it can work for these fellows that I'm working with, it can work for everybody. Yeah, it's, that's amazing. So yeah. we've covered uh, some very important ground. One is about how to self-reflect and ask our question ourselves these questions that help us have a sense of where we're at with our uh, social connection and our well-being. And also that if we are sensing a bit of that loneliness, isolation, having that self-compassion that helps regulate us in order to be able to uh, have those physiologic benefits that you described and reach out to others and have positive connections. Uh, and are there other 
uh, very practical strategies for building on those positive connections and so social connectivity? Oh, there's some undeniable research that says, you know, if you are in a, so a spiritual or a religious group, oh, you've, you've actually got a much better health outcome, a better health and longevity. Now, a lot of folks will say to me, no, enough with organized religion. I'm not part of that anymore. I was, I've offered. But there are spiritual groups. There are nature walks. There are other ways to um, kind of attach meaningful life to something bigger than yourself. Yeah. Jean Houston calls it living the mythic life. You know, just be able to expand beyond your own daily struggle to what is the greater meaning in my life here? That has a positive effect on health and longevity as well. And we know from Blue Zone research all around the world, some of my favorite research, I went to areas in Japan. I'm, I'm going to go back to, I did early research even in Kiev that was looking at their yogurt. I'll be in Bosnia, Herzegovina. I'll be in Slovenia all this summer doing more research on how do people in small villages manage to have such healthy profiles what is their degree of social bonding that contributes to it? Yeah, wonderful. Sounds like uh, some great lessons to learn from our, our brethren all around the world. And yes. These, yes. yes, that's wonderful. Well, as we close this segment, any take home message, any key things you'd like our audience to remember about social connection? Mm, just know that your actual body is wired for deep connection and it shows up in everything from a biophysical marker like your blood pressure or your blood lipids to the length of your chromosomes and the telomeres, the end caps and how you age. And so take it seriously, those social connections and strengthen them wherever you can. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Meg Jordan, for oh, joining yeah. us on this segment. Uh, on social you. connection. And thank you to our audience for listening to this Lifestyle Medicine podcast series. See you on another one of these. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye.